Hi, I'm Joe, and I'm a student of Bhante Chandana. Bhante is a wandering monk, and at the moment he doesn't have a permanent home or a monastery. So he depends on the donation and generosity from his students and supporters. So if you find any of his videos uh, helpful or beneficial to you and the people you know, please consider uh, making a donation to him at the link below. Thank you so much and have a good day. Today we continue our journey um, in the Sutta Exploration Series, week number 94. And the very first of the sessions of 2024. For today's session, I chose a sutta that is uh, a special, uh, uniquely special sutta, because of the message that it has within it, and to make it happen, we had to go back to Majjhima the middle length discourses, and specifically Majjhima Nikaya 21. Akachupamasutta, which is the discourse where Lord Buddha discusses the importance of maintaining tranquility in the mind, but, but while also engendering, cultivating a mind of forgiveness, endurance tolerance, kindness, and loving kindness, specifically. And it is the simile of the saw. The part about the saw actually comes way at the tail end of the discourse. As the case was with the Madhupindika Sutta, the honeyball discourse where at the end of that beautiful discourse, Venerable Ananda turns to Lord Buddha and says, Bhante, it's like a dessert, a honey ball. Wherever you try to nibble at it, it's so sweet, it's tastes, it tastes of honey. This discourse was just like that. And Lord Buddha says, so it is. And then Venerable Ananda asks him, Bhante, what should be this discourse's title? How should we canonize it? And he says, well, Ananda will just pick what you just said, the image that you provided for us, which is the honey ball. And you don't see that throughout the sutta, other than in that segment. So in that sense, this sutta is similar because the title of meaning the saw that a carpenter uses, that a lumberjack uses to cut wood, to cut down tre trees. That's the saw that Lord Buddha talks about. And it's a powerful image, which I will leave. If this is the first time that you're um, hearing about this discourse, uh, it's going to be a fun one. <laughs> so... Uh, and try to see if you could find yourself in it. Occasions in your life where you might have been in situations or are dealing with difficult circumstances in your life currently. And see if the teachings provided here could be used. Ultimately, that is the objective. The Dhamma is not for pastime. 
there's a teaching, the juiciness of it only shows up in your own daily life, your own difficult circumstances. When you put these teachings to the test for you, in order for you to benefit as countless other people have throughout history since they were introduced. So this sutta is the Kakachupama Sutta, Discourse on the Simile of the Saw, Majjhima Nikaya, MN21, the middle, middle length discourses. So let's begin. This is the new translation, which I just finished this week. Um, there's another recording of it, narration, recitation, which I've done several years ago. Uh, well, not that long, a few years ago. Uh, but um, I decided to completely redo the translation. Um, and uh, here it is. I have personally heard this. At one time, the Blessed One lived at the monastery offered by Anatta Pindika in Jeta's Park in the city of Savati. It was during that time that the Venerable Molia Pagguna was spending much of his time associating with the bhikkhunis. His association with them was such that if any bhikkhu were to blame or criticize any of the bhikkhunis in the presence of the Venerable Molia Pagguna, he would become visibly upset and irritated by it. As a reaction, he spoke very much in favor of the bhikkhunis to protect them. And if any bhikkhu were to blame or criticize the Venerable Molia Pagguna in the presence of the bhikkhunis, they would then become upset and visibly irritated. And in their reaction, they would speak much in favor of him as they tried to protect him. This, therefore, was their association, the nature of the relationship held between the Venerable Molia Pagguna and the bhikkhunis. If you recall, a few weeks ago, Molia Pagguna, we, we encountered him again in uh, a sutta where he kept on asking um, Lord Buddha about, uh, well, who is it that is making contact? Bhante, who is making, uh, you know, who is it that is feeling? He didn't get the hint. He kept on, uh, excuse me, but he, because he was coming from a very Brahmanic uh, where there is the Atman, the self or the soul specifically. So it must be that thing that is unchanging, that is feeling or making contact, etc. And that's the same Molia Pagguna. However, here we see uh, a different scenario, a different aspect of his life where he is associating with the bhikkhunis and the bhikkhunis were protected. We don't know whether this was happening during the Vasa or not, uh, but uh, the bhikkhunis were supposed to be under the protection of the Sangha. That's how it's supposed to be. You know, um, and um, here we see uh, an unusual uh, situation for a bhikkhu uh, because we have rules as to how often are we supposed to associate with bhikkhunis. And Lord Buddha had rules specifically for one of the eight uh, severe rules that uh, bhikkhunis had to follow in order for them to be ordained and receive the higher ordination was that a bhikkhu had to go and teach them the Dhamma. So bhikkhus did go, did instruct, um, and have and hold Dhamma discussions. However, this sounds like it was happening too much with the same bhikkhu, and that is a red flag. Especially when we look at the details, when one bhikkhu says anything or anyone says anything um, remotely uh, critical of Venerable Molia Pagguna, the bhikkhunis would become upset. And similarly with the Venerable One, when anyone would say anything about the bhikkhunis. So, um, it is rather uh, unusual, if not totally inappropriate, for that setting. And we're going to see as to why. 
Then a certain bhikkhu came and approached the Blessed One, and after paying his respects, sat to one side and said, Bhante, the Venerable Molya Pagguna has been spending much of his time associating with the bhikkhunis. His association with them is such that if any bhikkhu were to blame or criticize any of the bhikkhunis in his presence, he would become visibly upset and irritated by it. So he's repeating the segment that we just went on over. Uh, and if I'm uh, so, I'm going to go through this uh, quicker. And if any bhikkhuni, a bhikkhu were to blame or criticize the venerable uh, Molya Paguna in the presence of the bhikkhunis, then they would become they would become upset and visibly irritated. In their reaction, they would speak much in favor of him, protecting him. This, therefore, is their association, Bhante, the nature of the relationship held between the Venerable Molya Pagguna and the Bhikkhunis. Now, this is very, uh, it's also important that nothing else is being stated, where it's clearly being delineated that Bhante, this is the nature of the association. No one's accusing him of any major, uh, uh, basically, parajika, a defeat type of an action that is, uh, you know, uh, something that's, let's say, happening between the venerable and the bhikkhunis, um, sexual or sensual or anything like that. None of that is being mentioned. However, this type of behavior does and has the possibility and uh, the probability to take one there unless the person we're talking about or the people we're talking about are noble disciples. But we don't know yet. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain bhikkhu and said, Bhikkhu, in my name, go and tell the bhikkhu Molya Padguna, the teacher wants to speak with you, friend. Uh, not that he was the friend because he is the bhante, he is the teacher. But because this bhikkhu was going to go and speak to Molya Panguna, he needs to address him as a friend. Uh, so that's the friend part. It's not Lord Buddha saying friend to Molya Panguna. Thus, that bhikkhu went and informed the venerable Molya Panguna. The teacher wants to speak with you, friend. Yes, friend, replied the venerable Molya Panguna, as he quickly came and approached the Blessed One. After paying homage to the teacher, he sat to one side and the Blessed One spoke these words. One thing, it's, uh, uh, I, I might have mentioned this before, um, but if and when someone came to Lord Buddha with, uh, uh, with a critique or not necessarily gossiping, but something that had the nature of blaming um, someone else, something that they noticed about another monastic, despite all the details that might have been provided to Lord Buddha, Lord Buddha would never, once the person was in his presence, he would never start scolding. You don't see that. Unless he visibly saw it, he was present to it. Otherwise, Lord Buddha would use this method, which we're about to see. Pagguna, is it true that you are spending much of your time associating with the bhikkhunis? maintaining an association with them in such a way that if any bhikkhu blames or criticizes any of the bhikkhunis in your presence, you become visibly upset and irritated by it. And further, as a reaction, you then speak very much in favor of the bhikkhunis as if protecting them. So Lord Buddha is asking to see if it is true. Now he might very well know it is true, but Every action that Lord Buddha engaged in, he didn't just think about the present moment, the people involved right then and there in that context. Lord Buddha, you don't see that happen ever. Lord Buddha also considers the other two aspects of time, one being the past in the context of have other arahants, have other Tathagatas, when they face this circumstance, did they do the same thing that I'm doing? If not, if I am singling myself out, then Lord Buddha would never do it. Every action that he's committing as a Tathagata or as a teacher of the Dhamma, 
the king of the Dhamma, it had to match, and only a Buddha would know that. And then there's a segment, usually, when those segments of the discourses do occur, Lord Buddha mentions that. Such as when people come and ask for something for Lord Buddha to do, uh, uh, to grant them, and Lord Buddha would turn around and say, this is not something that the noble ones are known to do or have done. So he takes into consideration the past. Similarly, he thinks about us in the future. How will future generations of practitioners will view this scenario? So he's giving an opportunity for the accused in a sense, because they're accusing him technically, Amolia Pagbuna, to get a voice, to get his moment and to say yes or no. So he never takes it, he never presupposes or presumes. He always gives the person the opportunity to speak and to say, yes, Bhante, I do. Yes, I agree. Or no, Bhante. So that he just asked a question. Do you protect them? Do you do, you do these things? And look at how Venerable Molia Paguna responds. Yes, Bhante, that is true. That's it. That's all he says. But look how Lord Buddha is going to respond to that. But Pagguna, as the son of a clansman, have you not willingly and through the faith in your heart left the security of such a life by deciding to go forth into homelessness? Yes, blessed Lord, I have. Pagguna, it is not appropriate nor suitable for the son of a clansman who willingly and through the faith in his heart has left behind the security of such a life and who decided to go forth into homelessness to be spending much of his time with the bhikkhunis. Now, there's a term that is often used, a phrase in the suttas, where in English it's uh, seeing mind with mind or connecting the chitta with the other person's chitta, heart to heart, to see clearly. And Lord Buddha had that power to see whether Molya Paguna in fact was doing something or even had any intention of uh, being more than a, a bhikkhu to them, to be involved with them in an inappropriate way. Lord Buddha saw that that never was the case and never has happened. And Pagguna is very, Venerable Molya Pagguna is very respectful towards Lord Buddha as well. He's not putting up a fight. He's not saying, but wait a minute, you know, you, you know. And this allows us a purview to see that Venerable Molya Pagguna was really understanding what Lord Buddha was saying. He's saying, but you left that kind of a lifestyle behind you, Pagguna. You're not in the business of trying to impress females because that's the function. And they don't have to worry about singling you out and selling out the rest of the bhikkhus as bad guys and you as the hero here. That doesn't work in the Sangha. That has no place, he's saying. Favoritism basically is not a place for a true monastic in the Sangha. That's not supposed to happen. Now, of course, there are preferences and, and we are people, but here, it, it, apparently it had gone way past that point. So Lord Buddha goes ahead and, and is going to give further instructions to not just tell him, no, don't do that. Lord Buddha would always give the student um, it's like you pull the weeds out of a pot, a, a soil, a, a plant in, in a pot. If there's weeds growing in that soil, instead of the plant, you remove the weeds and everything else that doesn't belong there. Whatever you want to plant, it's not, you know, it's encroaching upon them. You remove those un, unwanted ones 
Um, and then you plant something else instead. Because if you leave it idle, if you leave that soil, having removed the weeds from it, guess what? They will come back. It, they will grow back. So you have to plant instead of it something wholesome, something that you want to be growing in there, the orchid, the flower, the I don't know what. But in this case, Lord Buddha is removing the unwholesome quality in this case, something that will get him to be engaging in blamable behavior. So before that, he, Lord Buddha has to give him step-by-step -step instructions. Therefore, Pagwana, if and when someone, someone blames or criticizes the bhikkhunis in your presence, you should give up any reactions or impulsive behavior that are more appropriate for those living the lay life. A reaction that is more fitting to the common person to engage in. That's why Lord Buddha asked him, but you left that life behind you. You willingly, through the faith, faith in your heart, you went forth, Pabbaja, you took. And now you've taken the Upasampada, you're a bhikkhu with higher ordination. So you cannot function like a normal uh, male uh, citizen of the community um, surrounded by uh, females who love and respect them. There needs to be a difference in your behavior. And sometimes people are going to come and say something not so pleasant or even true about those female friends of yours. But these are not your female friends. They are bhikkhunis. They also have taken the vows. They also have gone forth. So you have to be responsible to be selective with how often you engage with them and how you especially react to what's happening because how we react towards a person in a positive way can really change the way they think and they feel and relate back to us, especially in the context of monastic life. Because we have nothing to do with the lay life. That's how it's supposed to be. But these dynamics, so we are seeing a lot of social dynamics here that often are neglected to be considered, to be looked at when we look at the sutta. Or similar suttas where bhikkhus and bhikkhunis are engaging in dynamic relationships and we are social beings. So you have to be very, very careful, especially in the position of a teacher, to see what's happening between the students and work accordingly to protect them, both, both parties, from anything bad that will happen. Otherwise, they will happen despite the rules that we have, because people are people. Again, unless you're dealing with noble disciples. So, instead, Pagguna, in such moments where the bhikkhunis are being, let's say, criticized, blamed, and he's witnessing this, in such moments, you should train yourself in this manner, Pagguna. My heart will not be shaken or become agitated, despite what I may hear. So he's turning his attention upon himself and his reactions, his emotional reactions. So he's placing yoni so manasikara on the right thing. So he's practicing wise reflection, radical attention. Because it's so easy, it's so tempting when someone says something bad about someone we care about. We know. You're gone. Your emotions have taken over. The mind has lost its tranquility. So Lord Buddha is saying, you need to be observing you, only you, at that moment. Because you're here for a purpose. To go beyond these baser instincts. And you, Lord Buddha continues, I will not utter any evil words or behave in an unseemly manner. 
as a reaction to what I am witnessing. So you're applying right effort here because obviously there's a surge, there's this flood of emotions coming up. The body temperature has changed, your, your, uh, your eyes are dilating, your skin pores are opening up, right? Because you're ready for the attack because someone said something bad or mean about someone you care, about whom you, you have feelings. Instead, I will remain with a heart that is palpitating with compassion and loving kindness, without an angry thought to be found within it. So here you have, within these lines of verses, you have the entire Noble Eightfold Path. You have the entirety of the four aspects of right effort. You have the entire Idipada, the four bases of psychic power or potency of success. You have the entire seven factors of awakening. You have the entire four noble truths. But one has to look at it broadly instead of, oh, come on, you know, if somebody's saying that mean thing about my friend, I have to have a response. I must be justified in my anger. And that's what we have in the world. Everybody's looking for justification for their anger, for their baser instincts. Well, if I do have that anger and I'm justifying it, the other person also has theirs. So where does it stop? Nowhere. Until someone does put the stop there. As Lord Buddha does in encouraging Venerable Paguna. That Paguna is how you must train yourself. And even if, Paguna, anyone was to come and strike or beat any of those bhikkhunis with their hands, or while using sticks or weapons, or throwing rocks at them, then at that moment you should respond with a trained attitude by reflecting, my heart will not be shaken or become agitated, despite what I may hear. I will not utter any evil words or behave in an unseemly manner as a reaction to what I'm witnessing. Instead, I will remain with a heart that is palpitating with compassion and loving kindness, with not even a single thought of hate or anger to be found within it. In this world that we live, uh, this statement of you know, Lord Buddha's to Venerable Paguna, even if you see the bhikkhunis getting, getting beaten up physically, you shouldn't become agitated. What many people might go ahead and, because you have a, a class of uh, modern day uh, Buddhists who even blatantly come out and say, oh, Lord Buddha was even a misogynist or there's this thing, or even if he weren't, other people must have added this later on against women. Nothing could be further from the truth. Lord Buddha is not saying stand there and watch. He's not saying stand there and let this happen. Lord Buddha was very pragmatic. But when you witness, when you hear this and you are there, of course we have to stop it. We have to, uh, you know, there's, there's one way you can, you know, uh, there's the lovely story of the Arahant I mentioned him before, I forgot his name. I'm bad with names. Um, but he was visiting a home. He was an Arahant. Um, and he was uh, a gem cutter, the layperson whose house he had gone to. And the king sends his guards because they bring him a huge ruby that is uncut. And he's a gem cutter. But at that moment, he's in the kitchen and the Arahant is sitting right there in their house because he's a regular. He's, you know, they always invite him. In those days, we, had the, we didn't have that rule that you cannot enter the house. Um, basically, you avoid it. So he was sitting there with the family. 
And the man was cutting some flesh, some meat that he had purchased at the, from the market to prepare lunch. So with bloodied hands, he picks up the ruby and he looks at it and he says, okay, I'll, I'll take care of it. I'll cut it. So he puts it on the chopping board next to the meat. Now they had a pet bird in the house. Either it was a crow or a parrot. So while he's not looking, the bird sweeps down and plucks that gem ruby and swallows it. Now the man comes back into the room and looks for the gemstone and he can't find it. <clears throat> he looks around, he can't find the ruby. He turns to his wife and says, oh, did you take it? And she says, no, husband, I haven't touched it. Who else is there in the room? The Arahant. And soon enough, he musters the courage to go ahead and ask the Bhante, he says, Bhante, did you take the gem? And he says, of course not. I can't touch anything. But he says, they look at each other. So sooner or later, they get to the point where he is now accusing, in fact, beating the Arahant. By the way, the Arahant had seen what had happened. So he saw the bird sweep down and swallow the ruby but he cannot say anything. So the man thinks he has taken it. So, but it's the king's ruby. He will die if he can't produce it. Long story short, he beats the Arahant to death. But before the Arahant dies, as he's spitting blood, he's being kicked in the gut. This old Arahant, weak, who's not basically fighting back. The bird sweeps down because it sees blood coming out of his mouth. So it's like, oh, more food. At that moment, the gem cutter, the householder, kicks the bird. And the bird flies to the wall and slams down and dies. Now the Arant lifts his gaze and asks the householder, could you, could you check the bird? And he says, what, you know, why, what is your concern? He says, please check the bird if it's alive or not. You're going to join the bird, he says, if you don't talk. But he goes and checks the bird and he's like, yes, it's dead. And he says, okay, now I can speak. He says, while you went inside, the bird swallowed the ruby. So he cuts open the belly of the bird and there it is. But he says, Bhante, why, why, why didn't you tell us? He says, because I couldn't, because I knew you were going to cut him open. You were going to kill him. And who was going to responsible, be responsible for that? I would. I would cause another being's death, and I would not tolerate that. That's, not, that's wrong. You're dealing with a noble disciple. <laughs> so why do I mention this? If a bird was in question, the, the health and life of a bird, let alone a human being, let alone a bhikkhuni. So the quick conclusions that people make with ignorance and delusion don't fit the dhamma. So of course the bhikkhu is, is going to block, he's going to throw himself in front of the bhikkhuni so that they don't get hit if that is uh, possible for him. He's not tied down, let's say, um, or, or he's not being assaulted. But the key thing is not to have his mind become agitated. Remember, that is what we're dealing with. It's not about getting even. It's all about the person. That, Pagguna, is how you must train yourself. And even, Pagguna, if someone were to blame or criticize you in your face, again, you should train as earlier by saying to yourself, my heart will not be shaken or become agitated, despite what I may hear. I will not utter any evil words or behave in an unseemly manner as a reaction to what I am witnessing. Instead, I will remain with a heart that is palpitating with compassion and loving kindness with not even a single thought of hate or anger to be found within it. So even if someone criticizes you, and that will happen. Unfortunately, we live in a world where we're always taught or encouraged 
to think that everybody is supposed to like us or at least not criticize us. Well, that is delusional living. That is delusional way of thinking. There's no such thing. Sooner or later, somebody will criticize us. Somebody will blame us. It's one of those eight aspects of uh, living a life, uh, the, the eight uh, conflicting states that come, praise, blame, gain, loss, all these things. So Lord Buddha says, despite all these vicissitudes, to remain unshakable, spotless, unmoving, is the noble one's way. So that is what he's encouraging Pagguna to work towards. That, Pagguna, is how you must train yourself. And if, Pagguna, someone was to come and strike or beat you with their hands, or while using sticks or weapons, or throwing rocks at you, then at that moment, you should respond with a trained attitude by reflecting. My heart will not be shaken or become agitated, despite what I may hear. I will not utter any evil words or behave in an unseemly manner as a reaction to what I am witnessing. Instead, I will remain with a heart that is palpitating with compassion and loving kindness, with not even a single thought of hate or anger to be found within it. So if a person is able to do this, then you're dealing with an anagami. To be tossed around and to be treated badly, but not to have or dwell on yeah, I'm going to get you this way. I'm going to do this to you. It's like, yeah, well, just wait for me to, I'm just waiting for the opportunity to strike back. And you might not do that physically, but we do that verbally. Next time someone says something mean to you or unfair, what you deem to be unfair, instead of going into your, not necessarily protective mode, but preparation or preparedness to go ahead on the attack, waiting for them to quiet down if they're saying bad words. Most of us, when we are listening, we're not listening. In fact, we're preparing for an attack, counterattack. Remember, in this path, in this Dhamma and discipline, Lord Buddha talks about three kinds of actions. Mental action, verbal action or speech, and physical, bodily action. We should not be like other religions or religious paths where all, they only talk about the supremacy of the physical action and they neglect the other two. No. Lord Buddha started with the primacy of the mental action. That's where it all begins. So when someone's saying unfair things to you, criticizing you, how do you respond in your mind before you actually open your lips? You unleash something at them. So this world presents us with many opportunities to practice. And especially if you're on the path of wisdom, oh, you will get plenty of practice. If you speak about the Dhamma, genuine Dhamma, you're going to get a lot of people who say a lot of Adhamma. How do you deal with that? Especially when they come after you. <laughs> I know because that happens to me on a daily basis. <laughs> Emails, things like that. But where is your heart? Lord Buddha asks. This is a great opportunity to practice non-agitated state of the heart. And if I'm not there, then I have to work towards it. Ah. That is what he's encouraging Venerable Molya Pagguna to be doing. But Lord Buddha doesn't stop there because you can almost sense here that it might have been a little bit too much for Molya Pagguna as a person. He might even be like, his chest might be swelling up. He's almost maybe, maybe, this is a presumption on my part, that he might be on the verge of crying a little bit or becoming sad because of what Lord Buddha will do next. Now let's pay close attention. That, Pagguna, is how you must train yourself. 
Then the Blessed One turned and addressed the rest of the bhikkhus gathered. The attention had to be shifted because it was too much on Molia Pagguna. Because in his mind, he's like, Bhante is asking too much of me. Ah, perhaps. We don't have any footnotes. We don't have any, you know, commentators haven't done much good work in that department about the physical, the human element, the contextual elements there. But we can use our imagination and intuition, especially, to understand from these events. So Lord Buddha now turns to the other bhikkhus, and he is going to extend, expand on the audience. So it's no longer just one person he is directing these instructions to. Bhikkhus, there was a time in the past where I gladdened the hearts of the bhikkhus by giving them a reason to limit their meals to only one per day. As I spoke to them these words, Bhikkhus, I partake of only one meal a day. By eating only one meal a day, I experience few ailments, few disorders. The body feels light with more strength, and I remain in a comfortable state in the body throughout the rest of the day without any trouble. Therefore, Bhikkhus, if you also start eating only one meal a day, then you too will experience few ailments, few disorders, where the body will feel light and have more strength, while you remain in a comfortable state in the body throughout the rest of the day without any trouble. You don't see Lord Buddha flinging around his, his you know, index finger saying, this is what you should do, this is, this is, this. No. He's saying, because he also understood there are people of different constitutions, physical constitutions, that might not be, you know, work with them, maybe. Maybe they're too sick, which means they cannot strictly follow. They can't eat a whole meal. So they need to divide it up, or they need to take medicine. And for that medicine, they need to also take something to eat with that. So, but Lord Buddha, look at him, how he is instructing the bhikkhus, he's encouraging them and see what he's going to add. This is what he had told to bhikkhus in the past. And then he comes back and he says, after having spoken these words to them, those bhikkhus did not require me to continue on reminding them of it. So I only have to say it once, he says. There was no need for prompting them any further. All that was necessary was to continue encouraging them to stay mindful, maintaining their full awareness, sati sampajanya. For that itself was sufficient. If you have those two, the path to Nibbana is safe and secure, laid out in front of us. Imagine bhikkhus a chariot that is firmly harnessed to a group of thoroughbred horses ready as it stood, stationed on the four crossroads of a smooth and easy-to-navigate plateau. So basically, it's a terrain. It doesn't have too many topographical elevations, so it's easy navigation if somebody was to ride the chariot. And then a skilled charioteer who happens to be a master at taming horses approaches and by mounting the chariot takes the reins in his left hand, and the whip in his right. Having taken off and driving the chariot skillfully and without any difficulty, he would smoothly guide them this way and that, wherever and whenever he wished. So he's a horseman and a master charioteer, so he can't go wrong. So he knows how to handle these thoroughbred horses. But this is an analogy, a metaphor, a simile. In just the same manner, because those bhikkhus did not require me to continue on reminding them of it. There was no need for prompting them any further. All that was necessary was to continue encouraging them to stay mindful, maintaining their full awareness, for that itself was sufficient. You can almost hope that Lord Buddha is kind of leaning back and looking with the corner of his eyes at Molya Pagguna and saying, are you getting what I'm saying? 
I don't like to repeat this to you. I am going to encourage you every so often to maintain your sati and sampajanya, those two things, but you need to focus on this. So that's not my job to constantly remind you. You need to be inspired enough by the guidance from a teacher. No teacher is supposed to give you the same instructions again and again and again. Initially, yes, perhaps with some students, but there's other things that need to be done by the teacher, especially one as you know, tremendous as, as Lord Buddha's role as a teacher was. Therefore, because you must dispel and move away from engaging in actions that are unskillful and instead only engage in doing actions that are skillful and devote yourselves to those, that way you will gain much and grow in your practice and development in this Dhamma and its training. So he's also now giving a piece of the medicine that was given to Molia Pagguna to these bhikkhus because they're the ones who came and complained to Lord Buddha about him. So he's saying, you're not off the hook, as it were. You need to watch your behavior because when you're acting, when you're doing something, engaging in some action, check to see if it is skillful or not. Don't go ahead and test Molia Pagguna over there and saying, I'm going to go and criticize the bhikkhunis and see what he's going to do now. Is he going to follow what Lord Buddha said? No, 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 no. That is unskillful. That is akusala, Lord Buddha is saying. So don't even think about that. Observe and make this also your lesson from which you can cultivate a better version of yourself and grow in the Dhamma. Imagine because that close to a village or town, there happened to be a park full of sala trees but one which was being overwhelmed and crowded by an undergrowth of castor oil weeds. They're like parasites. They grow and they just like vines in some cases. Then a certain man approaches the park, someone who desires to protect and nurture the well-being of those sala trees. If you've ever seen sala trees, they're so beautiful. They're a mixture of redwood tree and orchids and jasmine and rose bush with beautiful flowers that almost look like they're from another universe. And um, so you can understand that person who wants to protect them. And he starts uprooting all the weeds, which were robbing the moisture and suffocating those trees as they spread. Thus, he removes and throws those weeds out, giving the solid trees their chance to grow tall unimpeded and without any danger. Then, as a result, those solid trees in the park continued to grow and developed healthy, healthily and in safety. Again, you, Lord Buddha is not saying in this sutta, by the way, the charioteer I gave the example of earlier, that's me, he said. You know, that was him, by the way. But he's not saying that. That example, and the thoroughbred horses were those bhikkhus who listened to him, and they quickly shifted their multi multiple meals a day schedule to only one. Because each meal meant they had to go to the village, which meant they were now going to see more exciting things. Visual, sound, they're going to hear music probably if it's later in the day. They're going to see women. They're going to hear women. So all these were obstacles for the bhikkhus. So it wasn't just the indigestion that Lord Buddha was concerned about mainly. It was also what the excess food was doing to the mind. Because if you have too much food in your gut, you won't be able to sit and go deep. Venerable uh, uh, Sariputta says, walk away from your bowl having um, still like four or five mouthfuls left that you could still eat. So leave your gut still, leave, it, leave enough room in it for some water. Fill it up with water, he says. Don't finish your whole bowl. So because then you have the other extreme where 
some monastics say, well, we have to keep this. So they, they turn this into like a, a rule that they will follow come rain or shine. But what they do is they fill up the stomach as if it's a warehouse. Unending, you know, curries and rice and, and noodles and this and that. I was like, I've seen, I've witnessed. I was like, where is this person putting all that? Well, I'm supposed to eat only once. Well, well, wow. And then be taken to the hospital? No wonder so many bhikkhus in, the, in, the, in Asia, at least in Asia, have diabetes. Young bhikkhus in their 30s, 40s. They take diabetic medication. I've seen them. They used to sit and everybody was taking medication. I was like, What's, uh, something's wrong with this picture. So there, we need to apply wisdom throughout. The Dhamma is all about wisdom. Otherwise, we can just turn that into a rites and ritual, and that's what it has become often. So let's not be slaves to these rules. We have to apply wisdom. Uh, now, in the same manner, because, and by the way, that man who comes in and saves the sala trees, that protector of the forest is also an example or the analogy, a metaphor, simile for Lord Buddha himself. He is saving those solitaries from the parasitical weeds that were growing in vines that were sucking the life out of the solitaries, the future arahants, if you will. Now, in the same manner, because continuously train yourself so that you dispel and move away from engaging in actions that are unskillful and instead only engage in doing actions that are skillful and devote yourselves to those. Excuse me. That way you will gain much and grow in your practice and development in this Dhamma and its training. Bhikkhus, once, and this is the, uh, oftentimes, I mean, there's so many segments to this sutta that people have favorite. And this one is one that is a favorite for many, many people. And this is the story of the householder, the lady, the mistress of a house. Uh, and we're going to be introduced to her in a second. Um, and uh, it's a very powerful image and story. And, but it's it based on, it's a fact that has happened. So Lord Buddha is referring to that here. Let's see. Bhikkhus once. Here in this city of Savati, there used to live a householder's wife by the name of Vedehika. Now this rich householder's wife had earned a praiseworthy reputation, where throughout the community they would claim, Lady Vedehika is gentle, she is kind and humble, always level-headed and calm. Now, it so happened that this Vedehika, the householder's wife, had a slave girl named Kali. Now, this slave girl, Kali, was smart, hardworking, and well organized in whatever she did in her chores. One day, Kali, the slave girl, began thinking My mistress, Lady Vedehika, is praised and recognized throughout the community as being gentle, kind, and humble, always level headed and calm. But I wonder if, in fact, this happens to be the case, really. Basically, is it just a front? Is it a mask? What if, she continues, the fact might be different? Is she, in fact, as they say, a calm person who does not show or harbor any anger within, or is she the opposite? Or could it be that because I have been diligently working, doing all my chores on time and not giving her any trouble, she is keeping her calm and is level-headed, where she does not become angry with me, nor harbors any rage or violence. Or is she the opposite of that, truly an angry person inside? Now, what if I try and test my mistress, Lady Vedeka? to examine if she truly is a gentle, humble, and calm person. So apparently she's, she's pretty, well, she's also sneaky, but she's pretty smart. 
Thus, as she had planned, that, planned it, the slave girl, Kali, woke up late the next morning. Now, as servants, um, as employees, uh, you had to definitely wake up before the, your lord, your, uh, your mistress. So you have to get up and prepare, you know, this and that. So you always have to wake up at least an hour before they do. So she, on the other hand, here, we see she did the opposite. Now, noticing her rising after her, the householder's wife, Vedika, then called her out scoldingly. You there, Kali, why didn't you get up early as you're supposed to? There was no reason, my lady. Kali replied, you evil wench, how dare you get up so late and for no good reason? In saying these words, the mistress became visibly angry and upset at the slave girl. Then Kali, the slave girl, began thinking to herself. So it appears that my mistress might very well have anger in her, which it seems she does not show. Perhaps so long as I continue being hard at work, getting up early in the morning before she does, being so well organized, then she will be gentle, kind and humble, level-headed and calm. I think it's best if I examine this further to find out for sure. So she's pretty incorrigible. Thus, the next morning, Kali, the slave girl, again decided to rise after her mistress, and even later in the day than previously. And again, the householder's wife, Vedika, called her out by saying, Hey, you, Kali, why did you get up so late? For no reason, my lady. What is that, you wench? Why are you getting up late, all of a sudden, and without reason? And then, in addition to her becoming even more upset, the householder Vedeika began swearing and hurling insults at Kali, the slave girl, by showing her displeasure, while mocking her in front of others. This led Kali, the slave girl, to ponder further. It seems that my lady does in fact have a lot of anger within her, which remains hidden most of the time. So it is clear to me now that so long as I continue being hard at work, getting up early in the morning before she does, being so well organized, then she will pretend to be gentle, kind and humble, level-headed and calm. I think it is best to test her further to find out more. Now the next morning, Kali, the slave girl, woke up even later than the previous times, getting up much later that than her mistress. And, as expected, the householder's wife, Vedeika, called her out by yelling, Hey, you, wench, you're still getting up late, I see. What was your reason this time? No reason, my lady. Oh, is that so, you wench? You get up later than your mistress, and for no reason, huh? And in her aggression, the householder's wife, Vedehika, reached over and grabbed the rolling pin and with it began attacking Kali, the slave girl, swearing at her while hitting her repeatedly in a fit of rage and slashing Kali's head with her blows until blood started gushing out from her. So she's running after her and slamming that rolling pin, which is pretty heavy and, you know, on her head. Meanwhile, Kali, the slave girl with oozing, blood oozing from her ripped head injuries, ran outside crying and screaming while getting the attention of everyone in the neighborhood as she called out her mistress. See, ladies, take a good look at the gentle and kind handiwork of your dear friend. So she's pointing at her head now. Observe the true nature of the so-called calm and level-headed one, but my mistress, Vedehika. Now we all can finally see the truth of how she treats others, the reality of the calm one's work. Cracking open my head, her only slave girl, now all covered in blood, all because I simply woke up late. 
Then the householder's wife, Vedehika, gained herself a bad reputation, where those in her community began saying, Vedehika, the householder's wife, is a monster, for she truly is rough and mean, lacking any kindness or gentleness, not at all humble, nor calm, nor level-headed, but full of rage indeed. In the same manner, because a bhikkhu may appear to be utterly kind and sweet, soft-spoken, very gentle and even peaceful. That is, so long as those around him do not confront him on a certain matter or try to question an aspect of his behavior. But it is only in such moments, namely, when he is touched by unpleasant experiences and especially when treated unfairly, that it can truly be seen and understood whether that bhikkhu is indeed utterly kind and sweet, soft-spoken, very gentle, as well as peaceful. So he's saying, looks can be deceiving. So if you're going to be a true bhikkhu, make sure that you withstand those difficult times without creating that agitation in your heart, becoming a victim to your rage, Otherwise, anybody can stay and live in a comfortable state where things are going exactly as you want them to, and you become like, wow, there's a halo over my head. Look at me. I'm a, I'm a bodhisattva, or I'm a, I'm a manarahant already. Look at me. Look. No. You test a person's measure of kindness, gentleness, calmness in those difficult times where things are not going according to plan, when things are not nice and dandy. After all, because I do not declare a bhikkhu who behaves humbly to indeed be easy to instruct and admonish, so long as he is receiving support, such as his requisites of robes, alms food, dwelling, and medical attention whenever he may need them. So he says, so long as the bhikkhu is getting his support, his requisites are being met and all that, and he's getting plenty of support. You know, I, and he's behaving humbly, kindly, soft-spoken and all that. I still will not declare him a bhikkhu to be of such a character. And what is the reason for this? It is because such a bhikkhu is one who is clearly pretending to be easy to instruct and admonish, who is behaving humbly, but for the mere sake of receiving support just as his requisites of robes, alms food, dwelling, and medical attention whenever he may need them. So, so long as doors are being provided for. Therefore, such a bhikkhu certainly is not one who is easy to instruct or admonish, but in fact is a fraud, merely pretending to be humble. The teacher's job is to really shake off the weeds, the gunk from whatever might be covering the person if they are a good person so there's going to be times where the teacher is going to be uh, seemingly rude to shake the student to not be so kind all the time you use, use the example of lord buddha you see sometimes how he, does, he talks to Ananda or to others. People have this image that Lord Buddha was just very, very always, exclusively, absolutely soft-spoken all the time. And that is not true. Depending on the situation, depending on the circumstances, Lord Buddha would call sometimes people stupid, fools, idiots dense, dumb. He, he calls people these, these, these titles. He gives them because they behave as such, so he needs to shake them. But today, if a teacher says that, well, there goes that support. But a true teacher should not care about such things. That's what Lord Buddha is saying. The, the true bhikkhu should not care about those things in order for them to display themselves as truly being admonishable uh, or instructable. 
gold is gold because it has been placed in tremendous heat and pressure continuously for a long time. It gets beaten up. It gets shaken up. But those are the things that are going to pull the dross, the dirt out of the gold and leave just the gold there intact. That's what Lord Buddha is doing. Therefore, such a big, oh, okay. However, the bhikkhu who is genuinely easy to instruct and admonish and who truly behaves with humility is so because he cannot be otherwise. For he utterly and genuinely respects, reveres, and worshipfully venerates the Dhamma while dedicating his life to living and behaving according to the Dhamma. That is the first sign to know if you are dealing with a noble disciple, by the way. Somebody who is genuinely walking the path. Nobody can say anything derogatory about the Dhamma. Nobody can claim something that is Adhamma to be Dhamma in such a person's presence. They will never dumb down the Dhamma, which is what we're seeing today, left and right. Sadly. As such, bhikkhus, you must train yourselves in this manner. We shall be easy in our acceptance and willingness to receive instruction, guidance, and in being admonished, and thus truly behave with genuine humility. He is also, you know, this message is, is also for Molya Padguna. He's not out of the scene, you know, he's still there. So Lord Buddha is so carefully, lovingly uh, putting, uh, you know, pulling the dart of, of ignorance, the poisonous arrow out, but he's also putting the balm, the ointment of healing to soothe the wound, to heal the wound. So that's why Lord Buddha's example is, is uh, uh, unique, to say the least. Because he does shake the student, but shake off the dross, the dirt. And then he's so kindly, he's coming back and he's saying these lovely words. This because of our deep reverence and respect for the Dhamma, which we worshipfully venerate while dedicating our lives to living and behaving according to the Dhamma. After all, that's why the person is there, not to simply obey Lord Buddha. They left willingly the household life because their faith in their heart was so strong. Nobody put a gun next to their head or a sword next to their neck and said, go ahead and take the pabbaja. Nobody dragged them as four, six-year-old, seven-year-old kids into a monastery and tossed them in there and said, okay, good luck. We didn't have the ability to feed a seventh mouth here. Go ahead and let the monastery take care of it. That's not the path. This is an adult who willingly went for it. For the love of the Dhamma. That is what makes a person continue being instructed and admonished and guided because they're looking at the bigger picture and, and what are they gaining from this. It is therefore in this manner that you should continue practicing and training every day because this because, because while speaking to you, the speech that others use might be stemming from any of any one of these five ways. If you can, just uh, this obviously is on PDF on the website, mindrelease.com. But I like you to not, this is not just for bhikkhus or bhikkhunis. Please remember that. Lord Buddha said this to, for us as well, all of us. So, People, when they're talking to us, their speech might be coming from any of these five places, or all five, depends. The words they say might be delivered at the right time or at the wrong time. The words they say might be true or false. The words they say might be kind or mean. The words they say might be intended to benefit you or to harm you. The words they say might be driven by metta, loving kindness, or by anger and hate. So 
they might be coming from all these different places. That's their prerogative. And then here's Lord Buddha's instruction. Now, when others address and speak to you, admonish or highlight something about you, they may say words that are delivered at the appropriate time or when it is neither the place nor the time for those words to be said. We've probably all been in situations where somebody said or we did say something that later on we went, or even at that moment, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Or why did this person say this here now? They should have said this to me in private. And at the right time, this is neither the place nor the time for that. And then enemies are formed in life. Next, they may say things about you that are true or that are completely false. They may say words that are kind and warm or the opposite of it, speaking mean and harsh words to you. They may be saying things that are well-intentioned to benefit you or the opposite, words that are driven by malice whereby their sole intention is to bring harm to you. Or they may say words that are impelled by metta and thus drenched in loving kindness. Or on the contrary, they are led by pure hatred and anger. In all these circumstances, you must train yourselves by reflecting. Our hearts will not be shaken or become agitated, despite what we may hear. This is a portion of what... Uh, Lord Buddha was saying, instructing to Venerable Molya Pagbuna, by the way. Uh, half of these verses are going to be those. We will not utter any evil words or behave in an unseemly manner as a reaction to what we are witnessing. Instead, we will remain with a heart that is palpitating with compassion, while defiantly shining the warmth of metta to the very person speaking to us thus with a heart that remains empty of hate or anger throughout. I chose to use the word, uh, the adverb here to qualify, metta. It, metta needs to be defiant, rebellious. Metta is not something passive. At times, it needs, because you're going against ingrained almost uh, reactionary responses that coming out of you at that heated moment. How courageous are you to stand your ground and say, no, I choose to respond or react differently? What if this person is coming from a hellish place? I mentioned this um, one time. Uh, this was a, a real event. I wasn't a witness to this, but I heard uh, because it was, you know, circulated around uh, in the U.S. This is an event that took place in New York City in the subway system. So it's about five or six p.m. It's a rush hour, um, and every business, you know, man, woman, they're getting back to the subway so that they can get home. So they're exhausted. And New York is notorious, is known for, you know, people are on the edge. Uh, you know, the, things are much quicker. That's what I'm trying to say. Not to demean anyone from New York. I've lived there for a while. So anyhow, uh, suddenly a man with three children get in one of the, you know, one of the subways in one of the carts, I guess, the, the cars. And uh, they find a place to sit down. And now the kids are jumping all over the place. They're so antsy, but the father who looks like to be, you know, their father is almost like a ghost. He's sitting there quietly without any affect, no feeling. You cannot detect anything except for what looks like indifference. Meanwhile, the children are jumping up and down, taking newspapers or books from the hands of the people, the other occupants of that car in the subway, in the train. So the people are fuming. Slowly, slowly, you can tell the anger, the aversion, resentment is increasing exponentially until one of the children yells out loudly for no reason. And the father comes too. He just 
he looks and he sees his children are all over the place. He quickly gathers them close to him and he, say, he starts apologizing to everyone. And he says, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm terribly sorry, I'm so sorry. And so he's, he becomes alive to them, but they're still mad. They're thinking, what kind of a father, what kind of a parent are you? And he says, please forgive us. Uh, we're just coming back from the hospital. My wife, their mother, is in, was, was in the ER. We lost her. She died in a car accident. So that, this is, a, 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 if I'm, this is how I remember. I heard this story over 25 years ago. And it's, it's a poignant story, especially because what it did to the listeners, the people who were so raging mad, suddenly it shifted. It went 180 degrees opposite, in opposite direction because now everybody was pouring. Some of them even started crying for the children and for the man, for the family that had lost the matriarch of the family. It's, it's a touching story because it really happened. So can you bring metta? Because they were flooded with metta in their hearts at that moment. That's how quickly metta can do its magic. But can you defiantly hold your ground and say, no, I choose to behave differently than I've always done? Thus, by starting with that person, the person who is annoying you, that person who is saying those things, Lord Buddha is saying, these are the things you need to say to yourself. Our hearts will continue shining metta ever so vividly and brilliantly, starting from that person. To everyone in existence, everywhere, as it boldly swells and expands boundlessly without any resentment, demands animosity or fear. Metta is courageous. It is boundless. It is also relentless. You put the limits on metta. Metta will never put limits on itself. <laughs> and it's never depleting. It is enhancing. It is enriching. It is in this manner because that you should continue practicing and training yourself, just like a man who comes with a shovel and a wheelbarrow, intending to empty out the earth of its soil, as he exclaims. I will carve and empty out this whole entire earth. I will make all the dirt, dirt and dry soil on it disappear. Imagine, a wheelbarrow and a shovel. So he goes on and starts digging and plowing, scattering the dirt and dry soil here and there, spitting and even urinating on it, trying to make the earth disappear as he keeps yelling at it. Become emptied of earth. Be without earth. Now, what do you think, Bhikkhus? Would he be able to make this great earth empty of earth? No, Bhante, because this great earth is vast and unending. It is impossible for anyone to make it become without dirt or dry soil. So the man will only frustrate himself in the end, overexhausting himself and thus become solely disappointed, sorely disappointed due to his futile efforts. In the same way, because while speaking to you, the speech that others use might be stemming from any one of these five ways. The words they may, they might, so he repeats that. Uh, so it might be delivered at the right time or the wrong time, true or false, kind or mean, intended to benefit you or to harm you, driven by metta, loving kindness, or by anger and hate. So he repeats that whole section. Uh, I need to um, jump. But please read this on your own because I have the whole sutta there complete um, for that reason. In all these circumstances, you must train yourselves by reflecting. Our hearts will not be shaken or become agitated, etc. So thus, by starting with that person, our hearts will continue shining metta ever so vividly and brilliantly to everyone in existence, everywhere as it boldly swells, the metta, swells and expands boundlessly without any resentment, demands animos animosity or fear. It is in this manner because that you should continue practicing and training yourself. 
So Lord Buddha is going to give just like that man's example with a wheelbarrow and a shovel. He is going to give several examples to drive the point across, to make them remember at least these similes, metaphors. Just like a man who comes with various colored dyes and paints, with reds, yellows, turmeric, blues, and orange, as he claims, I will draw and paint pictures in the air. I will make pictures appear there in space. Now, what do you think, Bhikkhus? Would he be able to paint shapes and colors in space? No, Bhante, because space is immaterial and therefore has no shape to itself, no form, and thus no appearance. It is impossible for anyone to paint pictures in thin air. So that man will only frustrate himself in the end, overexhausting himself and thus become sorely disappointed due to his futile efforts. In the same way, because while speaking to you, the speech that others use might be stemming from any one of these five ways. So he repeats that, delivered at the right time or the wrong time, true or false, kind or mean, intended to benefit you or to harm you, driven by metta or by anger and hate. And he, he says that verse again, to spread the metta, uh, it is in this manner because that you should continue practicing and training yourself. Just like a man who comes with a grass torch that is ablaze. This is the third simile here in this section. Shouting as he does, I will burn away by heating up and scorching the river Ganges, drying it up completely with my grass torch. What do you think, Bikus? Would he be able to make the mighty river Ganges burn and dry up with his grass torch? No, Bhante, because the mighty river Ganges is vast and deep. It is impossible for anyone to make it burn and heat up, let alone dry it up with a grass torch. So that man will only frustrate himself in the end, overexhausting himself and thus become sorely disappointed due to his futile efforts. You can't see in some places of the Ganges River, you can't see the other side, that's how wide it is. In the same way, because while speaking to you, the speech that others use might be stemming from any one of these, this is the fourth uh, section that's coming up um, where we will see another simile coming up. So he lists all those five ways that people could or would address us in all these instances, we need to watch our mind's quality. Is it agitated, shaken, or not? And is there metta flooding your heart and you defiantly shine the warmth of metta at the person who's saying these things, especially the mean things to you, at you? And starting from them, you open up, permeate all throughout existence, the metta in your heart. And then Lord Buddha says, imagine bhikkhus a bag made of catskin leather that was properly beaten and threshed, smoothed, rubbed, softened, and polished without any wrinkles left, whereby it was no longer rough and thus without any crackles. And then a man, bringing with him a stick, starts exclaiming, I will take this bag made of catskin leather that is now properly beaten and threshed, smoothed, rubbed, softened, and polished without any wrinkles, and make it rough and crackle again with my stick. So it's going to, he's saying he's going to make, he's going to undo all that has been done to that leather. Now, what do you think, Vikus? Would he be able to take the softened and polished catskin leather that is now properly beaten and threshed, therefore smooth, and with his stick turn it back to being rough and crackled? No, Bhante, because the bag made of catskin leather has already been properly beaten and threshed, smoothed, rubbed, softened, polished, and now is without any wrinkles, whereby it is no longer rough and thus without any crackles the man would not be able to undo its softness by making it crackle again with his stick. 
So that man will only frustrate himself in the end, overexhausting himself and thus become sorely disappointed due to his futile efforts. In the same way, because while speaking to you, the speech that others use might be stemming from any of these five ways. So here we see the fifth uh, uh, section coming up. And this is where we get to the main uh, simile that is uh, the reason why this sutta has this title. Uh, in, the same, in all these circumstances, you must train yourselves by reflecting. Our hearts will not be shaken nor become agitated, despite what we may hear. We will not utter any evil words or behave in an unseemly manner as a reaction to what we are witnessing. Instead, we will remain with a heart that is palpitating with compassion, while defiantly shining the warmth of metta to the very person speaking to us thus with a heart that remains empty of hate or anger throughout. Thus, by starting with that person, our hearts will continue shining metta ever so vividly and brilliantly to everyone in existence everywhere, as it boldly swells and expands boundlessly without any resentment, demands, animosity, or fear. It is in this manner because that you should continue practicing and training yourself. And even if, because, thugs and criminals were to grab hold of you and start cutting you in half with a two-handled saw, at that moment, if your heart becomes flooded with the defiling thoughts of evil, evil against them, then you simply will no longer be practicing according to my teaching. And thus, you would not be holding true to your duty in my dispensation. You just heard one of the most powerful statements in all of the 84,000 teachings of Lord Buddha. This is a challenge. He just challenged us, Lord Buddha, the teacher, the king of Dhamma. By saying, at that moment, imagine two big lumberjacks with a two-handled saw with which they would cut these huge redwood trees. Instead of a tree, it is you that they are cutting. Can you imagine, first, withstanding that pain, but just the thought he's saying, even if you have the thought of wanting harm to come to them, basically to do to them what they're doing to you, you would be failing in practicing what I have been teaching you, he says, Bhikkhu. This is a challenge. We decide if we want to take it up or not. And you have the rest of your life to prove it. And life will give you plenty of opportunities to try. It's not going to have two people coming with a two-handled uh, saw. You have less, less, you know, intense situations. Can you do that? Not entertain any negative, unwholesome, unskillful states of mind. To not become agitated. Can you do that? That is Lord Buddha's encouragement here. Instead, because in such moments you must train yourselves by reflecting, our hearts will not be shaken or become agitated, despite what we may hear or experience in this case. We will not utter any evil words or behave in an unseemly manner as a reaction to what we are witnessing. Instead, we will remain with a heart that is palpitating with compassion, while defiantly shining the warmth of metta to the very person speaking to us thus with a heart that remains empty of hate or anger throughout. Thus, by starting with that person, our hearts will continue shining metta ever so vividly and brilliantly to everyone in existence, everywhere, as it boldly swells and expands boundlessly without any resentment, demands, animosity, or fear. It is in this manner because that you should continue practicing and training yourselves. 
Thus, bhikkhus, by constantly reflecting on and bringing to mind the instructions given to you here in the simile of the saw, you, uh, would you say that there will still be a type of ill treatment of speech that you may receive, whether small or insignificant or large and significant, uh, insignificant or large and significant, that might be too much, too great for you to bear or endure? Absolutely not, Bhante. Therefore, bhikkhus, you must constantly reflect on and bring to mind the instructions I have just given you here in this simile of the saw, for it will certainly be to your own benefit and happiness for a very long time indeed. These were the words spoken by the Blessed One himself, which, on hearing, made all those bhikkhus gathered there and listening to them become utterly delighted and pleased. An incredible sutta, beautiful sutta. Definitely challenging. <laughs> the Dhamma is not something, you know, this is what I mean by often like it's not a ritual, it's not a set of rites and things and this and that. It's not about giving dana. It's not about sitting for a retreat or this and that. It's it, all those things are part of it, yes, but part of it. But this is the main crux of the dhamma. How is the person living one's life? Because you cannot deny life. And many ex uh, intense experiences are happening to each and every one of us. In a daily base, on a daily basis, how much of the dhamma is being present with you, holding your hand at that moment, or are you taking refuge in your defilements, in the impulsive way of thinking, in the reactionary way of behaving? Otherwise, what am I really? Am I really taking refuge in the triple jump? or in the training? So these are questions that only you, the person, can answer. So I'll stop talking and uh, see if there are any questions. OK. All right, if there are any, you can send them my way later on. Let's uh, transfer some merit. Akasathachabhumatha devanagamahidika unyantanganamoditva chirangrakantulokasasana Akasathachabhumatha devanagamahidika unyantanganamoditva chirangrakantudesana Akasathachabhumatha devanagamahidika unyantanganamoditva chirangrakantumamparanti Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May the Triple Gem bless you, your loved ones, your families. May you be prosperous in your endeavors, in your work. May you be skillful in the choosing of your thoughts, in the choosing of your words, and in the choosing of your physical bodily actions. May you not feel alone in those moments that you are up against life all by yourself and you have no tools, nothing to protect you. You have the entire armory, weaponry, the arsenal of the Dhamma at hand. Nothing, nothing could come between you and awakening so long as you're working towards that. Baby steps at times, but that's fine. Steps nevertheless. So, Sukihotu, and until next time, be well. Mm.